Lecture One, Building Bridges Between Science and the Humanities. My book has two parts of the title, The Aesthetics of Emotion, on the one hand, and Up the Down Staircase of the Mind-Body on the other. This lecture breaks down the two sides and begins to propose a relationship between them. First, the aesthetics of emotion. Now, the idea of aesthetics and emotion is easy to understand. We walk out of a movie, we either like it or hate it. We feel the same thing about a book or a play. We can be moved by a dance, performance of some kind, a play, a movie, or not be moved by it. But the aesthetics of emotion sounds a little awkward. It's a kind of a metaphor, and I'm proposing here that understanding aesthetic processes can help us understand the scientific approach to emotional processes. More generally, this implies that the humanities can help us understand science better, and vice versa. Science can help us understand the humanities. Now, let me talk about culture wars. There have been culture wars on the relationship between science and the humanities. We all can recall instances at the university where someone in the hard sciences is looking at someone in the soft sciences, I use the words intentionally, and looks down at them as not being rigorous. Going in the other direction, the person who's doing the hard sciences can be seen as very geeky. So we have prejudices. We see this in England in the 1960s. C.P. Snow, successful author and scientist, on the one hand, got into a kind of debate with the literary critic, Raymond Leavis. But the argument was ad hominem, it was personal, it was not productive, they never are. Snow, on the one hand, favored scientists and industrialization, and the value of learning technology in the new age of science. Leavis, on the other hand, emphasized the value of creative human responses to the interpretation of literature together, collaboratively, and deal with the advance of technology in that kind of critical light. In the late 19th century in England, the late Victorian age, there was a similar argument between Thomas Huxley on the one side and Matthew Arnold on the other. But they were both members of the same private club in London, the Athenaeum, and so the argument was less acrimonious. They were more gentlemanly. For Huxley, he believed that scientific knowledge would help solve practical problems and have ethical value if these laws could be extended to the moral world. In essence, the intellect, like a mechanism, was capable of clear, cold logic, ironically, like a steam engine. Together with the strong will, knowledge of the laws of nature, people could respect each other and work for the common good. Matthew Arnold, on the other hand, was lecturing at Cambridge in 1882 on literature and science. He argued that of course it's important to know the results of scientific studies of nature. They provide us with instrumental, practical knowledge. But on the other hand, they can produce narrow-minded specialists. Human nature needs to understand what has been learned and the effect that this knowledge can have on one's own life and the social world. And of course, this is directly relevant to global warming and similar issues in our era. In Germany in the late 19th century, the philosopher, psychologist, sociologist, culturologist Wilhelm Dilthe made a distinction between Nazir Wissenschaften, natural sciences on the one hand, and Geistes Wissenschaften, human sciences on the other. The natural sciences invoke laws to explain nature in terms of causes and effect. General laws, particular effects. The human sciences, in contrast, try to understand nature in terms of relations between parts and wholes, whole life experiences that are culturally, socially grounded, historically grounded in time. By focusing on the life world, Dilthe sought a science of the mind, that was grounded in culture and history. Now look, 
how do we reconcile science and the humanities? Thus far, the differences have to do with science being concerned with practical explanation and causality. Humanities, an understanding, interpreting a person's interior life world. Causes and effects, parts and wholes. Now look, science and art can sometimes look alike. Let me give you an example. It shows that the differences aren't so great when we take a look more closely. Here we have an image by Stacy Spiegel, an artist who was trying an experiment working with scientists. He worked with a master printmaker and scientist to produce what he calls hydrodynamic prints. How do they do it? Well, they take a very large vat of water, have a range of inks of different uh, intensities and viscosities. The water in the tank is heated and stirred, so there's motion. As the motion in the tank is settling, the ink is poured into the water and a large sheet of paper, two by four feet, is suspended over the water carefully by two people, lowered onto the surface so it just touches momentarily, set down and very gently raised up. See what the image looks like. Now here on the other hand is a video produced by a colleague at the University of Toronto at Scarborough, Matthew Wells. The video is about how vortices form and transform in a liquid. When I asked Matthew about this, he says, you know, I used to think a lot about the aesthetics of images. Indeed, when going to university, I was choosing between art school and physics. Both are beautiful, but I chose physics as it seems a bit more timeless, whereas fashions come and go in the fine arts. But look at the product. They're very similar collaboratively developed, visually pleasing, but different kinds of meanings depending on how you're looking at the works. So we have here complementary processes, science and humanities having a potential complementary relationship. You have artistry in science. By that I mean acts of noticing phenomena, placing them in context, and expressing them in a beautiful way. We see an example of this. But there is also logic to the humanities. On the one hand, you can have rigorous examination of language, how it's used to express ideas clearly and in meaningful ways. And on the other hand, as we've just seen, visual works expressing scientific principles in a beautiful way. So the distance is not so great between the two. We have a kind of paradox of engagement, however. Scientists generally disappear behind the fabric of the scientific process. Matthew does not present his video as a beautiful piece of art. He's just an author on a paper in which it appears. But on the other hand, artists and authors are salient. They stand out in the process as commentators bringing perspective to the world. Scientists in the background, art is present and salient. Now, in the context of science, the role of the scientist has developed over time. Scientists began as craft persons who had practical goals that served certain knowledge-oriented ends. For example, grinding lenses for glasses that were then used for telescopes. In essence, the scientist can be seen as a born tinkerer. They learn to follow certain epistemic virtues as part of their self-identity as scientists. Honesty and precision, a search for truth that's presented in an objective manner. So science needs both tools and logic to explore the nature of reality. And we can trace this back, as I will in the later lecture, to the origin and use of tools which evolved substantially since Paleolithic times. But it's one thing to discover and use fire, and quite another to understand and explain how it works. In short, science offers us the following. In the generality of the principles, you're able to predict and explain the particularity of events. This is a deductive process. General principles help us explain particular events. The humanities offer a kind of different approach. 
In the humanities, we reflect on the concrete impressions that situations make on us. Whether we're at a play or whether we're viewing art, the humanities are more concrete, more closely tied to culture, of course. They help situate us at particular times in human history. They reflect upon those times. The goal of an aesthetic work is to produce an experience that has a potential lesson or meaning embedded in it. But we have the experience first and consider the meaning upon subsequent reflection, whether you're walking from a, an art gallery or a film or after you read a book. Now, what is it about these materials? How are they organized to produce these effects? In essence, Aesthetics is the science of sensory experience. As a psychologist, I work with the process of experiencing visual things as they come at us, literary things as we move through them. We have the experience first. We understand the principles behind it that help shape the emergence of meaning for us. In the particularity of the work, you experience, discern, and understand the universality of its implications. So, science has abstract laws that can explain particular events. The humanities, on the other hand, present us with concrete experiences from which we can derive meaning about the nature of our world. Science and the humanities move up and down the mind, body, staircase in different ways as a consequence. Science works down from an abstract level to explain particular instances. The humanities, as I've said, move up the hierarchy from concrete experiences which, through reflection, teach us lessons about the world that we can formalize in an abstract way. In terms of bridging the two, we have to learn to shift between the engaged perspective in which phenomena are experienced concretely as in the humanities or observed and the detached scientific perspective in which the particularity disappear in favor of abstract principles. So science and the humanities are not far away. We saw the examples earlier on, but the underlying principles are shared from concrete to abstract, moving up or down the staircase of the mind-body and using the aesthetics of experience as a means for understanding the world around us and ourselves in a more profound way.